this whole team over here is loving that thing. <laughs> so um, good morning. I hope everyone had a wonderful time at the WAG last night. And those of you who were unable to make it, you missed a great, great launch party. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming so early. <laughs> Nine o'clock doesn't always seem so early, but today it seems early. Um, which it's not even nine o'clock, it's 9.30. Okay. <laughs> uh, just a few um, sort of housekeeping things. Um, again, um, turning off cell phones uh, during the presentation. Uh, please do not photograph or record or post to social media without getting permission from those people in your photograph. Um, you know, if you have any messages, they can be left at the recitation, um, what's that desk called? Thank you, registration desk. <laughs> uh, again, we have the elders, um, elder wellness room, which is in 2M70. So if, again, these conversations are getting heavy, um, please uh, find one of us and we're, we're able to take you up there. We do not have nine circles today. Okay, my brain just went. I think we do we Chantel? Oh my god. <laughs> I don't remember. Okay, two. They might be across the street. I will confirm that a little bit later. Um, today, this morning, we have um, uh, our creative practice panel. And just before the creative practice panel, we have um, elder. No, yes? <laughs> elder um, Raven Heavy Runner. Um, to give us a few opening remarks. Is that right? So you guys are always laughing at me. Like, quick laugh. Quick laugh. I know. I know. Um, uh, to give some opening remarks about uh, creative practice um, and to give a little context for for the panel. So. stories growing up because we didn't have very good uh, reception of television. I think around the time we had like about three stations and one of them was from Canada and it was really kind of snowy. And so he told a lot of stories to us growing up. And I don't think that he ever thought that I would become a storyteller. And I, in a way, I, when people ask me if I'm an artist, I feel kind of bad now because I diminished the fact that storytelling was uh, a form of art for our people. It was a way for us to be able to entertain each other. And when I look at some of our indigenous art today, it's a storytelling. Um, and so I always admire those that are able to do art. I, I'm one of those uh, stick figure type people when I draw stuff. It's, it's really not very nice. So I, I, I look at the beautiful beadwork and some of the art that was uh, over at the, um, the the art gallery this last weekend, and, and the spoken word was beautiful. And so, and for me, I feel like that art is medicine to me when I see that art. So I want to, uh, I want to uh, uh, thank you all for having this panel and enjoy. We're gonna ask uh, Jenny Willis to come and moderate this panel.
welcome. Very much appreciated. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, but this seems early, I feel. <laughs> and it's not like, oh, um, doesn't I don't know, normally it would be too early for me, but it feels early. Um, but thank you for being here. This is such a, a beautiful panel, I think. And um, all of the speakers and contributors are, uh, are people whom I admire so much. Thank you so much for the call to conversations, organizers, um, and community organizers. Um, I have the extra pleasure of introducing um, four participants for this panel, three of whom are here today. Um, and should I introduce everyone now and then people will come up afterwards? Uh, um, this morning we will hear from Gwen Banawe. Gwen Banawe is of Anishinaabe and Métis descent. She has published two collections of poetry, Ceremonies for the Dead, Passage, and her third collection, Holy Wild, is forthcoming from Book Thug in 2018. A two-spirited trans poet, she has been described as a spiritual love child of Thompson Highway and Anne Sexton. She has received many distinctions and awards, including the Dane Ogilvy Honor of Distinction for Emerging Queer Authors from the Writers' Trust of Canada. Her poetry and essays have been published in national publications and anthologies, including the Globe and Mail, the Plains Magazine, CBC Arts, Sure. Rosanna Deerchild has been storytelling for more than 20 years, most recently as host of CBC Radio One's Unreserved, a show that shares the stories, music, and culture of Indigenous Canada. Rosanna is a veteran broadcaster having worked at APTN, CBC, Global, and NCI FM, where she hosted All My Relations. She has also hosted The 204 and The Weekend Morning Show on CBC Radio 1 and appeared on CBC Radio's DNTO. She is an award-winning author and poet. Her debut poetry collection, This is a Small Northern Town, shares her reflections of growing up in a racially divided place. It won the 2009 Aqua Books Lansdowne Prize for Poetry. Her second book, Calling Down the Sky, is her mother's residential school survivor's story. Rosanna is a co-founder and member of the Indigenous Writers Collective of Manitoba and has also contributed to numerous Indigenous newspapers. A Cree from Ogapan Napiwan Cree Nation at South Indian Lake in northern Manitoba, Rosanna now lives and works in her found home of North End. <laughs> Hiromi Goto is an emigrant writer from Japan who gratefully resides on the unceded Musqueam, Tsukumesh, and Slay Watu territories. Her first novel, Chorus of Mushrooms, was the 1995 Commonwealth Writers' Prize Best First Book, Canada and Caribbean Region and co-winner of the Canada Japan Book Award. Her second adult novel, The Cat of Child, was awarded the 2001 James Tiptree Jr. Memorial Award. She's published three novels for children and youth, a book of poetry, and a collection of short stories um, for adults. Her other honors include the Sunburst Award and the Carl Brandon Parallax Award. Hiromi is a mentor in the Writer's Studio program at Simon Fraser University, a member of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, and is a board member of Planetude Magazine. She's currently at work trying to decolonize her relationship to the land and to be a responsible guest of a turtle island. The final um, participant this morning is, um, is Cyrus. 
is Marcus Ware. Cyrus is a Vanier scholar, visual artist, activist, curator, and educator. Cyrus uses painting, installation, and performance to explore social justice frameworks and black activist culture. He is a facilitator and designer at the Banff Center and for 12 years was the coordinator of the Art Gallery of Ontario Youth Program. Cyrus is the inaugural Daniel Spectrum Artist in Residence 2016 to 17 and is also a core team member of Black Lives Matter Toronto. So those are our panelists this morning for this creative panel. Um, and I'd like to note at this moment that Cyrus is unable to be here um, physically in person, but has sent a video message for everyone, an introduction of himself. So, It's sort of working. Oh, wonderful. Oh, nice. Okay, yes. Uh, um, so maybe all of the panelists can sort of say a few words about what they're thinking about um, in this moment about the questions that were posed to them or the topic of this panel, and we can sort of get things started that way. So I guess I've been nominated to go first because in true QPOC indigenous tradition, we're putting the trans woman out front because <laughs> we are the stormtroopers of the movement. Yeah. And I say stormtroopers in a Star Wars context. Yeah, it's important to, to remember. Wache, Matigmas Indigena Cause, Mkwanda Dem, Kejanong, Adonchaba, Nadada, Kejanong, Namama, West Virginia, Onchi. 
and it's my first time in Winnipeg. And yeah, I know, I know, it's really strange and cool. There's like Nishambe people everywhere, which I'm not used to, yeah. Um, I got to see Katarina Verment yesterday and she took me on this like guided tour of the North End, which was really cool, yeah. Yeah, she was like, that's, that's where I got Slurpees <laughs> when I was 10. And I was like, oh, cool, I don't wanna go in there. <laughs> we won't come out, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, yeah, so I was thinking about the questions that were posed and how I wanted to talk about my own creative practice and what I see the role of creative practice in indigenous communities and, and QPOC communities and how I see that relate to the kinds of work, work that we do. And I guess I started thinking a lot about my Nishnabe name. And my Nishnabe name is uh, Matikmas, which means oak tree in Nishnabe Moen. Um, and I was really lucky, I think, and uh, through conversations I've had with other indigenous uh, trans people and queer people, I was really lucky to have a lot of elders and a lot of access to culture and ceremony. And so when I was named, I was named in a skirt and I was named as a woman and that is not common. Um, so I was really lucky and the elder who named me when he was explaining when he was explaining Matikmas to me and that idea of the oak tree, it's the oak trees that come actually after the forest fire. And so one of our traditional practices was sometimes we would maintain the land through actually starting fires and, and maintaining the forest that way. And what would happen is after that fire had gone, um, little oak saplings would be the first trees to repopulate that part of the forest. And as those trees, little oak trees, would grow up, what they would do is they would rise, and you know oak trees go real straight and real tall, and um, they would provide canopy cover, and underneath their shade, all of the medicines and the forest floor would start to come back. And so I see that as a metaphor for the way that I use my art and my work, which is to create space and to try and stand and lift as high as I can and hope that underneath me and underneath that work, that that forest of ourselves, of our people, of, of what it is to be indigenous and trans and indigenous and queer starts to regrow and comes back into being. And when I was first published, it was 2012 or 2013, I was 23 when my first book of poetry came out, and I had an older generation of two-spirited writers, people like Gregory Schofield, um, that had come before, but there was no one from my generation. And the way of talking about two-spirited identity and talking about queerness really hadn't evolved very much. And so there was a big disconnect. And it was very lonely as a young two-spirited poet at that moment in my life. And now what I see happening is we have a lot of young, queer, two-spirited writers coming out and creating really vibrant and diverse works. People like Billy Ray Balcor and Joshua Whitehead and Lindsay Nixon and starting to see a shift in what indigenous poetics and indigenous writing is. And I think that's a really good sign that queerness and indigeneity and two-spiritedness are evolving and those conversations are changing and we're not stuck in a lot of the same conversations that we had before. And there's still a link to older generations and there's still that thread of connection that runs through, you know, indigenous writing, indigenous art practice, but it's starting to evolve and go into new ways. And I'm really happy to see that shift, that really profound shift in our writing and our creative practice. And in terms of what I think the value of that space and that work is around, you know, indigenous creative practice, for me, as an Anishinaabe trans woman, you know, there's so little visibility of indigenous trans women anywhere. Uh, and I think, and I always have this conversation with people, I think I'm the only published one, at least with these collections, uh, in Canada. And I have these conversations with people, and they're like, no, 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 there was someone in the 90s, they published a short story in an anthology. I don't remember their name, and I think they're dead. And I'm like, okay, cool, but all right, I'm still, I'm still alone here. Um, and so for me as an indigenous trans woman, I think a lot of the writing and the work that I do is 
simply to create voice and space and representation and to show indigenous trans women as holy, as sacred, as rooted in our cultures and our ceremonies and as vibrant and important and valuable. And we often talk about, and there's a very small community of indigenous trans women in Canada that are connected to each other. And we talk about how many of our sisters are dead, how many of our sisters are missing, how many of our sisters never make it to actually be themselves in the world because they can't get through all of the barriers and obstacles. And so my work, I think, in my creative practice is simply to try to create space for them so that they can see themselves in the world and that they know that there is a path for them in their culture, in their language, and their traditions that will hold them and, and keep them safe. And one of my friends, um, who's an indigenous trans woman uh, living in Halifax, her and I ended up getting assaulted in public in a two-week span from each other. And it was kind of funny because we were both like, oh, I don't want to talk to you about this because I don't want to trigger you and your trauma. But we're like both fucked up separately texting each other. Um, but th that moment was really interesting for me because it reminded me of how incredibly in danger we are as indigenous trans women constantly in the world and how much we need to hold each other up and reach towards each other and try to find that power and that strength. And that's what I seek to do through my creative art practice. And I write a lot about sexuality, indigenous sexuality, trans girl sexuality. I write a lot about intimacy and romance. You know, uh, for trans women, particularly indigenous trans women, the people most likely to kill us are the cis men that we're in love with. <laughs> the cis men who love us are most likely to murder us. And this is just a facet of our life. And so I write about that because I hope that creating these narratives generates some kind of change and that there's some kind of representation and presence for us in the world. Um, and I think that's the same for indigenous and QPOC people generally, is coming to art and coming to our creative practices to show ourselves as whole, as vibrant, as filled with love, as beautiful, as powerful, in ways that we are never seen and shown in the world, and to try and author create ourselves into being. I come from the Lee Miracle School of Poetry, Indigenous Poetics, which is, you know, it's prayer, it's, it's praying. And when we create these worlds and we create these stories of ourselves as vibrant and loved, you know, I think that's a prayer into the universe, into creation to say, let's hold this up. Let's hold ourselves up as beautiful. And that's, I think, in a short, short way, what my practice is about. Now, follow that. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> you did that on purpose. <laughs> like, I ain't following her. Screw you. <laughs> Fine. Um, thank you, Gwen. That was beautiful. Gwen, everybody give some love to Gwen. I know it's super early, and uh, when I'm invited to these things, I always say yes, because when community calls you, you always have to answer. But I really hate you right now, Chantal. It was so early this morning, I was like, why am I awake on a Sunday? Oh, right, I'm gay. <laughs> <sighs> so much work. Um, my name is Rosanna Deerchild, and, and um, I come from the Opipanapi and Cree Nation in Treaty 5 territory in northern Manitoba. Um, my people are Cree, Bush Cree, as my mom would say. I remember once I asked her, I'm like, Mom, what kind of Indians are we? She said, we're Bush Crees. Like, I don't know if that's on the map, but I'm going to look it up. Uh, so um, today we're talking about creative practice. And uh, I had some really well thought out notes that I wrote down. I looked at the questions ahead of time, was like did my homework, and then promptly left them at home because I'm smart that way. And it's Sunday, and it's freaking early. So I was out dancing last night. I saw Sadie, shout out Sadie, uh, at the uh, 200. And um, I was with my, my good friend, Alex, who I love. She's one of my favorite persons in the world. And um, I, I, I stood there looking at all these young people and um, remembering when I came out 20 years ago, I guess now. Uh, and remembering being one of those young people dancing, throwing my body around and underneath the lights and swaying to the music and thinking I had some sweet moves. 
my kids assure me that is not the case. Um, and um, looking at the aunties that sat in the, in the crowd and thinking, Ma, they don't look like they're having fun, <laughs> first of all. And Ma, I wish they would come dance with me. And thinking about community. And um, now I was one of those, those aunties sitting on the side of the, making smart comments and giggling and laughing at each other and watching the young people dance and thinking, wow, we've come so far. We've come so far as a community and as, as people and, and as love. And, um, and uh, we were talking about Miss Purdy's. Anybody remember Miss Purdy's? Miss Purdy's Women's Club? Shout out Miss Pease. And, um, and thinking about my days then, you know, I grew up in a small town, a small little racist town called Thompson, Manitoba. Anybody been there? Never go back. <laughs> oh, Patana quit. Um, I grew up in this little town, and it was very racist and racially divided, and um, much of my childhood was just spent trying to survive being brown. So there wasn't a lot of uh, space for me or language for me or ceremony for me to find out my two-spiritness. Um, bisexual. I don't like that word, really, bisexual, because it infers that I'm having sex, which I'm not. <laughs> Are you single ladies? What? Um, <laughs> so I didn't have a lot of language or a lot of words or a lot of um, uh, reclamation in, in that sense. You know, we heard words like dyke and, and lesbian friends, and I never understood what that meant. I'm like, I don't get that. What, is, what the hell does that even mean? Um, growing up and hearing these kinds of words, and all I knew is what you can't be that. <clears throat> Which is not to say that I, I didn't, I wasn't. I mean, I was kissing girls by the time I was nine. I'd, we had to move out of a neighborhood one time because I, we, I was kissing all the girls, and, and it was awkward for my Christian parents, and I was like, what? <laughs> What's the big deal? <clears throat> Apparently, there was some petition from parents. I don't know. Anyway, so that's kind of the <laughs> we petition, anti row petition. I was like, what the hell? Um, so, uh, yeah, I didn't have the words for it, but which is not to say that I didn't have those feelings. It wasn't to, not to say that I, I, didn't, I didn't fall in love with the, all the girls. I think it was probably clear to me that I was different when I was, um, gosh, five or six or seven by the time I was thinking about girls the way that uh, my friends thought about boys. And um, it took a long time for me to actually even like boys. I thought they were gross. This one time, this boy kissed me. This is a Me Too situation. When I was like 10, this boy kissed me, stuck his tongue in my mouth, and it felt like a wet pit. And I was like, what is wrong? And I punched him. <laughs> and then I ran, went around the corner and kissed his sister, which was much more pleasurable. <laughs> it's like, this is much better. Um, and it wasn't until that uh, I moved to Winnipeg uh, when I was 20. I, I graduated from high school where I, I was weird and nerdy and hung out with mostly boys. And uh, they called me bro, <laughs> which is funny. Um, so there, there was a knowledge there, but nobody ever put the word on me. Nobody ever said, you are a lesbian or you are gay or you are. I, I remember um, the boys that I used to hang out with beat somebody up once because they called me um, a dyke. Um, which I appreciated, but not really appreciated. I'm like, well, what's wrong with that, right? Like, wh why? I appreciate you're, you're trying to stick up for me, but at the same time, it's like, why are you sticking up for me about who I am? Um, so it was quite an interesting contradiction. So I didn't come out until I was in my 20s and going to college and um, becoming a storyteller. Um, I had a huge crush on somebody in, in college. She had the most biggest, beautifulest blue eyes I'd ever seen, and I just was like, wanted to dive in them like the ocean, and I didn't understand these feelings. And uh, I didn't actually come out and say the words to myself and acknowledge that in myself and, and um, um, try to understand that part of myself until I was probably about 20, 24. Um, and I went out into the gay world. I started going out to clubs and started you know, trying to meet other gay people and trying to be part of community. And what I found was very lonely because it was this mainstream version of being gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, transgendered. Um, it was 
there was no community there. There was no culture. There were no brown people. And um, I found it very uh, isolating. I couldn't find myself in, in this community. And then one day, I, I met some women. Alex was among them, Alex Wilson. And uh, uh, a bunch of them, they all showed up in these leather jackets and looked badass. <laughs> I was like, who are they, stars in my eyes? Ooh. They all sat in there all butchy and like, ah, remember those terms, butches and fams? Do we still use that language? I don't even know. Are we, are we still good with that? Butches, shout out to the butches. I love you so much. Yeah. Woo. And uh, I was just like, who are these women? I must know them. So... I started hanging out with these women, Jeanette and Alex, and, and that's where I found a home. That's where I, I, I recognized myself. That's where I um, opened my heart up and opened my spirit up to, to who I truly am and who I truly became. And they were so loving and so gentle and guiding me down this path of two-spiritness. And that's when I started going to the gatherings. And I, I, I met this guy, Raven, at one gathering, and we fell in love with each other, like, right away, just boom, walking around holding hands. <laughs> and uh, we exchanged rings and everything. It was a big deal. Um, it's that, that kind of spirit love, right, that, that, that I found. I found a home, and I found ceremony there, and I found identity, and I found, like, the other, the unspoken part of myself that I had been carrying around um, since I was a child and had no word for. Now I had a word now I had a language. Now I had a place in the circle. And when that happens, um, of course, that informs your creative. That informs um, how you're able to write, how you're able to express. You know, it's like um, suddenly I had both limbs. Suddenly I had my voice. Suddenly I had my ears open and my eyes open. And I was able to express that kind of love without shame. I was able to express that kind of desire without... Um, somebody telling me it was wrong. I was able to be that person and be accepted in that circle. And, um, and that is amazing, and that is a, such a strength, and that is such um, a love that uh, can only bring positive things to your, your creative process. Um, you, can't, you can't do art with no arms. <laughs> you can't uh, write poetry without the love of poetry. And... Uh, um, the love of poetry is fed by the love of self. So um, much of my poem actually, poetry deals with being an indigenous person, being an indigenous woman, surviving in this patriarchy and this colonization um, without letting it beat you down. So much of my strength and able to do that work and able to be that voice and able to write those that that poetry comes from my my identity as a two-spirit woman um because i know that you know i, I ha not only do i have my ancestors behind me but i have my community i just want to shout out barb i've had a crush on her for the duration of my coming out process she never went out with me though can you believe it? <laughs> so I remember the first time I saw her, it was at, uh, it was at a woman's gathering, and she had on this um, hat. It had a feather on it. I remember, and she had jeans and boots and this shawl thing, and I was like, who's that? <laughs> and I just like, I've had a huge crush on Barbalicious. That's what I call her, Barbalicious. Barbalicious. Um, but... So you know these these women were were my were my um, <laughs> my naughty thoughts and my good thoughts and my and they just were always holding me up and so when you have that kind of community holding you up you can't fall uh, and so I go out there with a strong voice and I go out there with knowing um, that who I am is not only okay but it's necessary. You, you mentioned stormtroopers. I, I totally agree with you that trans people are stormtroopers. And uh, Star Wars, shout out Star Wars. And um, uh, I just want to acknowledge everybody in this room. Thank you so much for coming out on this Sunday and, and of course, to my community. And um, that's what I got so far. So 
Thank you. I think we should call that, like, Rosanna Deerchild, a sexual history. <laughs> yeah, that's not fair. You had crushes on everyone in the room. I couldn't make jokes like that. I, I have no crushes on anyone here. God. I had baby dyke crush on Marjorie Bocage. <laughs> I'll tell you more later. <laughs> it's just like, like confession time. <laughs> um, uh, it's an honor to be invited back to Treaty One territories and the homeland of the Métis. Goto Hiromi desu. Taihen o sewa ni natte mas. Arigato gozaimas. And thank you very much to Chantal and Sharon Paul for. Um, inviting me, and also thank you very much to all the volunteers. Um, it, I, I know there's so much work involved. Um, it's a lot of labor, and often it's unpaid labor, and this always happens, um, but it's also your work that makes this gathering possible, and so grateful. Arigato. Um, I have notes because um, this is... I, whenever I'm in, in a situation like this, I always think, I'm not a speaker, I'm a writer. That's why I write, because I can't, I have a hard time speaking aloud, um, although after decades um, now, it's, it's a little bit easier. But I think part of um, my relationship to writing has been to write back. Um, so I think... Oftentimes, when you have been verbally attacked um, and, and more um, in racist ways, uh, in homophobic ways, in transphobic ways, personally, often I feel powerless. It's like you're going about your day, minding your own fucking business, enjoying life, and then this attack comes from, it could come from anywhere, and then all of a sudden, it's a punch to the gut. Uh, it might not be a literal punch to the gut, but it feels like a punch to the gut. And I, in that moment, there's a feeling of what I feel like, what, I've, what I have felt like, is all of a sudden, you're a child again, and you've lost the words, um, and you feel powerless. And then you hold that inside you, um, and that turns into shame. And it's not even our shame. The shame is on the person who would do such a thing. But somehow their shamefulness, their shameful behavior becomes a shame that we carry around in our body because we couldn't say anything in the moment because we were struck powerless. And so what writing has enabled for me um, to do is to speak back to that moment where my power was um, unvoiced from me. And I can rewrite it. I can speak back to that moment, reclaim that moment, and shape that moment so that that moment has been transformed into something that will do good. Um, it does good for me which makes me a more healthy person so that I can live in a better way, not just for myself, but also for my family and my community um, and try to do good works. Um, and so writing for me is in, in extremely empowering um, and it's also about relationship. It's a relationship to the past and my engagement with it via language and words and story. And that also moves forward into the future. So I also think of writing and, and artwork as time travel devices because it travels me back to that moment in the past which I can't, re, I can't redo it. And that's the kind of thing that can drive you mad at night when you're lying in bed and you're like, and it goes over and over, and this, that's trauma. But you can rewrite that narrative 
and rebuild yourself in the best ways possible. And so, you know, in many ways, I feel like writing has saved my life. Reading has saved my life. Before writing came reading. Um, and before the reading, and when you read, we are always looking for uh, images of ourselves. Because when we see an image of ourselves in stories, it's a celebration. Um, you get to be, it's, it's an acknowledgement that you exist and that you, you're important and there's a place for you in this world. So when there's a history in publishing in all of um, Turtle Island um, as colonized land, the history of publishing has been white um, and mostly straight for the longest time. So, you know, my, I, I think part of my skill as a, a thinker or a writer is to simplify things, which, which, can, which, can, which is not necessarily a good thing if, if you're an intellectual scholar, um, but sometimes it's more manageable to simplify something than to parse them out into their tiny components. Um, depending on what kind of strategy, strategy, strategy you're taking um, for the story. So my, my simple question is if all the characters in a story were people who were walking around um, in the world, what's the demographics of all those characters in all the books and stories? Um, and uh, for a very, very long time, all the characters, the, the creative literary characters or the story characters were walking around um, in the story world were all white and straight. Um, and so I, I feel like my work as, as, as a writer is to start, is to balance that representation. Um, and until it's, until it's balanced um, and closer to reflecting the um, history, real history of Turtle Island, um, and the lives of all the people of color, all the queer people, all the trans people who are living here now. I'll, I will keep on peopling my stories until that balance is met. And it's, you know, not met yet. So I'll keep on doing this work. Um, so that's all I have to say for now. Thank you so much. Um, is this working again? I think um, the video is working now. So maybe the tech people have to take Um, I'm not sure, actually. Okay. It's not on the screen anymore. Um, maybe while that's again being figured out. <laughs> um, I would love to actually pick up on something that Hiromi, you were just specifically speaking about, but I think Rosanna and Gwen, you were also talking about, and that is um, representations, not just how, um, how many um, QT BIPOC people we see in literary representations based on this panel, but who is controlling those representations as well? And you probably anticipated this question as kind of the 101 question, but um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, writing back to other people's representations. Um, and how literature and art can be, um, um, how literature and art can also be transformative in sort of allowing people to become subjects in their own narratives as opposed to objects in other people's narratives. So. Oh my fucking God, is this gonna be the entire fucking panel? <laughs> Honestly, you're both older than me. You're both smarter than me. I mean, what is this about? God damn it, this is transphobic. This is a microaggression. I'm gonna smudge after this. <laughs> Fuck you both. Um, yeah, I mean that idea of, of representation and and writing back to other people's understanding of yourself. I think that that's something, you know, particularly as an indigenous trans woman, that 
I try to do. For so long, the word two-spirit really just meant gay and lesbian. And I still see that representation. When you say two-spirit, people assume you're gay or you're a lesbian. And so I always say two-spirit trans because I'm always like, I don't want you to think I'm just gay. Um, I'm more fabulous than that. <laughs> I'm the evolved version. And um, so in that context of representation, when I, when I do my writing as an indigenous trans woman, I really try to push in indigeneity and push transness together and put that into the world because so often they're thought as separate. And we haven't talked much about, at least in the discussions I've been in, how oppression is replicated within community. And we have a lot of transphobia in our community. And I saw that when I was generating work about being indigenous and trans and so many indigenous, indigenous publications and editors were turning that content down and that that door was closed. And when I look at you know, representation of indigenous writing, that there are no trans people represented. Um, the Malahat Review just did an indigenous special specific kind of issue. And you know, they had no trans feminine people in that issue. So I think there's huge problems around representation, particularly indigenous and trans. But I think for all of us, having our complexity visible and having our complexity shown and presented. But I think the more important thing for me is it's not just representation. It's not just having more indigenous uh, characters. It's not just having more QPOC characters out in the world. It's having representation that comes from everyone within a community. I think often we think we're meeting the representative test because we're like, oh, nope, there's a published Indian. Yeah, we, we got that box. But it's who within that community is being published. Is it indigenous men? Is it indigenous cis, you know, straight men? Is it indigenous women? Are all the trans people back off in the corner? Are all the queer people off in the corner? You know, and so I think when we look at representation, we have to unpack that and say, who's being shown from that community? It's not just having indigenous people show up and be seen. It's having all indigenous people that are a part of that community come forward and be seen. So I think we have to have a more complicated and nuanced conversation about what representation and, and, and making yourself a subject really means. That was really rambling, and I couldn't make any dick jokes. And I'm really disappointed about that. Can you ask questions where I can talk about cock, please? I'll try to. Because this is like yeah. 9 a.m., and I'm fucking <laughs> bored. There's like been no dick in Winnipeg. Like, Winnipeg is dickless. Like, I'm, I'm over this place. And even go on Winnipeg Tinder, I was like, I'm going to end up in the Red River. I'm just not going to, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to pass this over to you guys now. I see you looking away like, oh my God, she's going to pass me the mic. Thank you, Gwen, for being fucking fabulous. I'm sorry there's no dick here. I have mine, but it's at home. I didn't think to bring it. <laughs> Silly me. Hello, my name is Cyrus. <laughs> Queer Martin. gathering and I forgot my dick at home. I'm sorry. Um, representation, that's a tough one. Um, you know, because we're still not represented in literature. We're still not represented really in art. I mean, it's, you, you have to go out and find it. You have to go out and look for it. You have to go out and seek it out and ask for it. and and find those spaces that, that, that exists, and unfortunately, um, they're hard to find. Uh, and um, so you have to create those, those representations, and I don't know if I'm doing it properly or if I'm doing it right. All I know is that I come from a place um, where I love women, and, and I love men sometimes too, um, but only if they have a nice dick. And uh, so you have to sort of be that representation out in the world. And sometimes it's lonely. You know, like back when I came out, I, I looked around for those, for those stories. And uh, I found Christos. Christos. Um, and she was just, I still have like many of her books. And I still read them over and over again. I love Christos. And I found Gregory Schofield. Gregory Schofield, who's my gay boyfriend. I like to call him that. We're going to get married someday. Screw you, Mark. Marrying him first, and uh, you know, and so y we trade stories. It's like trading skin, right? And and it's trading hearts, and it's trading spirit. And and when I find somebody who is also um, part of that community, we we often will will trade words and trade uh, poems, and and 
I'm hungry for that. I'm still hungry for that, and I'm still looking to community to, to fill that that very empty place, you know, and um, we have QPOC here, and uh, fucking love you guys, and you guys are amazing. You've taken that space. You've kicked open that door. You're like, motherfucker, we here. And um, I just think that's amazing. Every time I go to one of the events, I just room full of queer people is is um, brings me to tears when I when I when I stand in those spaces because um, when I was first coming out, there there was no spaces. Um, there was very few. Uh, there was Miss Purdy's where we would all gather in the room and dance our asses off every weekend, and then we'd go have to go out into the world and be isolated and lonely again, and we'd have to find each other on the page, and it was. It was tough going, so, um, you know, uh, representation for mainstream is so skewed and it's so wrong and it's so ugly sometimes and it's just objectifying us and, and keeping us oppressed and keeping us the patriarch version of, of, like, how many lesbians, you know, fuck with long fingernails? Like, how does that even happen? I don't... Get off me with those claws, bitch. It ain't happening. No, no. Like... Here's a nail clipper, please. No. My sacred JJ is too delicate for those. I ain't happening. So, like, please. <laughs> Somebody make some good porn, okay? That's all I'm asking. Some good porn, some good, you know, poetry, some love. Let's just get in there and get naked with each other. Well, not right now, but, you know, it's Sunday. Later. <laughs> I'm just all dis distracted by Vijay J. <laughs> Shit, what was I gonna say? <laughs> oh yeah, representation. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's. I feel like sometimes representation is like a a, a trap. It's it's like a double-sided trap. Like you're like. Yes. It depends who you're representing, representing for, or who the audience is who perceives you as representing. Um, so it's that kind of hinge of, of which way it's gonna be decoded. Um, and as a, a writer who's committed to centering um, women of color and queer characters in my stories, um, I have no way of controlling how a reader decodes that. Um, and of course, the whole point is to structure or write the story in a very specific way so that the reader is guided to read it in the ways that I wish them to read it. But I have no sort of master control over how they'll read it. And also that would be kind of scary too, to have that kind of o overlord power anyway. Um, so I, th re I think representation is really important, um, but I also try to think of it as centering, centering a subjectivity rather than um, in sort of absolute representational terms. So it's more about positioning and power and the placement of the power um, in the character, or in the story. Um, and another point of representation is often we think of it mostly in terms of the body of the character themselves in terms of race or sexuality, gender, what have you. Um, but also think about the representation of culture and history in how the story is structured. So then that is the kind of echo that's not necessarily so visibly decoded as someone's, say, skin color. Um, but the shape of a story or the, or, or the ways in which the story mechanics are played out on the page also speaks to a different kind of representation. And I think, you know, when we start working with different forms or um, unraveling form or working it a new way, I think of it as kind of queering it. Um, you know, and thinking here of um, a Joshua Whitehead's uh, poetic form, um, you know, does that brilliantly. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think the video is 
Maybe, buddy. Um, Swear, and I'm based out of Toronto, Ontario. I'm coming to you virtually to talk a little bit about creative practice and about how I've used or engaged with Two Spirited and, and QT BIPOC issues within my work. I'm primarily um, a visual artist who explores Black activist culture through uh, an activist aesthetics, through drawing, through through painting sometimes, through installation art, performance art, um, and a variety of different uh, creative and making practices. My work um, uh, it stretches across a, a wide variety of disciplines, but the thing I want to talk to you about today is a specific a uh, project that I've been working on for a couple of years called the Activist Portrait Series. Um, and this is a project where um, I create very large scale portraits of black and indigenous activists um, across the north part of Turtle Island uh, who are engaged in direct action or engaged in, um, I, maybe maybe you could consider them small a activism as you know, getting involved in their local community or doing things that aren't necessarily front lines. Um, as a way of interrupting a variety of things, interrupting the sort of historic um, white supremacy that is embedded within within um, the art world and within uh, the medium of portraiture, where portraiture is usually reserved through classism and, and racism and, and sexism for rich white men. That's who gets their, their portraits painted most of the time, university presidents, popes, um, chancellors, uh, kings. Um, that's who we often see in the halls of our museums and galleries in the portraiture section, in the in the paint, you know grand painting section, is portraits of those people. Um, and so I wanted to interrupt that in, in an intentional way by instead recentering uh, uh, QT BIPOC um, organizers. Um, so that was one, one of the interruptions. And then, then the sort of interruption within an art historical canon um, and an interruption within, uh, you know, these institutions that, that end up showing the work where they suddenly have to grapple with a different kind of portraiture and a different kind of understanding of the sort of issues and themes that I'm working through. Um, the work is fundamentally a work of love. I am absolutely 100% in love with uh, these people who, for a variety of reasons, choose to put their lives on the lines, um, both metaphorically and, and often literally uh, in the, the work that they do on, on the day-to-day. -day. And so these, these portraits are an act of homage, an act of celebration, um, and a way of trying to establish a sense of resiliency and support around them, a buttressing of them to, to be able to say, we got you, we, we're celebrating you, we're here, um, please keep doing the work that you're doing um, because it's so, so vital in this community and landscape. Um, I think that, you know, this, uh, you've seen some of the images of, of the work that I do. This project has been, um, for me, a very, a very pleasurable one because I get to stare lovingly in the eyes of, of all of these people and ask them questions about the kinds of movement building that they do. You know, I asked them questions about time travel, if they could go to any time uh, and place in, in human history and get involved in social movement building, what would they get, what, what movement would they get involved in, uh, when and, and why, uh, how would they get involved? And then I asked them about their experiences of falling in love. So, you know, it's become a curiosity of mine just to find out what people say to the answers to those questions. But also, of course, every time they answer those questions, their faces change and I take lots of photos. Um, and record their audio and then listen to the audio while I'm while I'm drawing them. Um, so I get to sort of see their body and their and their face and their expression in a variety of different um, um, emotive states, which which has been really lovely. I think that when we look at this sort of idea of QT BIPOC empowerment um, and this idea of sort of survival, I think, and for us to be able to survive and, and thrive, uh, you know, absolutely creative practice is a really interesting way to to, it's an interesting thing to be deployed in this process because, you know, it it can bring people together. It can bring people together in really beautiful ways across vast distances, you know, to maybe to complete that project that Audre Lorde encourages us to do to relate across difference. We sometimes can do that through a creative practice or through a creative project because it is um, an access point that is really accessible and that is um, fundamentally something 
that um, maybe people come to it because they're they're curious about playing with the medium or they're curious about you know getting to try out doing something creative and then while they're there they get to have all of these relationship building moments and, and gatherings which I think are really beautiful. I think that um, you know between uh, two spirited and uh, QT BIPOC communities. There's um, one of the things that we, we sort of are, are grappling with right now is the immensity of the work ahead of us and figuring out how to both support Indigenous resurgence and the movement for Black Lives and address, you know, sort of the issues around abuse and systemic patriarchy and, and misogyny and address classism and address the sort of the ongoing violences against um, poor people, mad people, uh, sick and disabled people, uh, you know, sex workers, street involved people, you know, how do we do that work? And I think that a lot of how we can kind of come at it is through a creative lens because we do really need every creative mind on this project as we figure out how we're going to work together to try to make some sort of change. Um, so I think that um, there there is a huge use for creative practices uh, and artists involved in this movement. There's also a risk, of course, um, of the appropriation and the repurposing of activist aesthetic and of activist content um, as it becomes um, as it becomes appropriated by the mainstream and certainly by the creative class, which you know there is a process of gentrification that is implied in it and sort of connected to uh, creative creative class. And I think that that gentrifying even these processes and these processes of practice and these these issues and the, and and ways of working. Um, is definitely a risk and so that's something that we sort of have to work and sort of really be thoughtful about how what we get involved in and how we get involved but in general i think that it's it's a really useful strategy so i'm going to leave you with some images of more of these activist portraits um the the portrait series grew out of um, I was looking at images of some of these early Black Lives Matter protests that were happening across the states in predominantly white states, in predominantly white areas, where there were, um, the, the risk was quite quite significant. And I was thinking a lot about what it meant for them to, to put face masks on that said, I can't breathe, um, and, and to go into the middle of the Mall of America, you know, in Minnesota or wherever, and, and, and to take a stand in that way. Um, and it also grew out of a, an earlier project that I had been doing called Activist Love Letters, where, again, really trying to figure out how to support the survival of all people, and in particular, the survival of those who are putting their life on the line. I, you know, developed a letter writing project where I got people to write love letters to strangers, love letters to activists in their communities, and then I mail them. I've mailed thousands of them over, over the past uh, five years. And that project was very much about survive and thrive and about figuring out a sustainability of our lives. And, um, you know, out of that kind of grew a desire to get to know some of these activists a bit better and to get other people interested in knowing these other activists a bit better uh, as a way of getting them involved in the movement, but also in supporting the lives of these people. So um, thank you so much for the chance to share my remarks with you today. And I look forward to the discussion. Many thanks. was so beautiful. Um, so maybe we can continue some of the points that Cyrus brings up in this video, and that is um, one of the things that I was hearing is how aesthetics and medium and genre can come together. And I think some of you have been talking about this um, in certain ways, but I, I wonder if maybe you could just speak a little bit about the, the genres in which you write and how um, how those choices, or maybe they've chosen you, how they coincide or reflect some of the work, um, the cultural work that you're doing. Oh, for fuck's sakes, I'll go first. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I work mostly with poetry. Um, for me, um, poetry has always been the space in which all of me can exist. Uh, poetry, I, uh, for me, is my ceremony. It is my sweat lodge. It is my circle. It is my beginning. It is my end. It is my 
it is my spirit. Um, and so that is where I feel safest creating myself and defining myself and sharing myself with others. Um, I've been a poet since, you know, I was probably 12 or 13 uh, when I started writing journals and then I discovered this language of poetry and I discovered poets and, and what they do and what they can do and how they fill space with emotion, whether it's um, dark emotions or whether it's light emotions, whether it's um, uh, story or whether it's legend. Um, I always find myself in that space. And so when I'm creating love story, I mean, what better way is there to do that than with poetry? Um, because in poetry, you can be anybody and you can love anybody and it's all it's all part of the um, the universe and and the and the space that Creator has made you in. Um, so uh, that is my gift to the world, and it is the gift that the world gives me. Um, I feel like um, poetry is is where I can be my most authentic self, and um, it is where is how I I uh, give myself. So. Um, that is the genre that I that I choose to to speak with and speak in, and speak from, um, because uh, when you come from a place of ceremony, then that is the most honest place you can be. And and uh, for me, that is that is poetry. That's my language. That's my song. That's my that's my spirit. Well, that was really nice. Yeah, I like that. You didn't mention Dykes once, <laughs> but maybe later. <laughs> maybe later. You'll have to explain the fingernail thing to me. I don't understand. And I'll Google that later on my own. And I, well, I don't know if we want me to Google that, but maybe. Um, yeah, like I think I echo a lot of what you say around poetry and, and my love for poetry, because poetry has always been my first love. But when I transitioned, um, I started writing a lot of creative nonfiction and doing a lot of personal essays. And that kind of, for me, as a genre, arose out of like, a call to activism, a call to response, because I was just experiencing so much profound transphobia in my life. And I found this enormous gap in education and awareness, particularly around trans girls and intimacy, and particularly trans girls with cis men. And there's no ro romantic or intimate representations of trans women and cis men in loving and sexual relationships. There's like one movie on Netflix um, and like, it's okay, it's like a B movie, um, but that's about it. And there's no public discourse or conversations, but I was experiencing tremendous transphobia and violence in my romantic life. I was in, just got out of an abusive relationship for a year and a half with a cis man who was a white anthropology student from Minnesota, so maybe that was my mistake. Um, but who would say things to me like, you just like me fucking you because it validates you as a woman. Um, and I don't see you as a woman yet, but maybe someday. And this profound transphobia and violence that was, was filling my life. And so I started writing these creative nonfiction essays to respond to that. And so I started publishing them all over. And this theme and narrative of trans girl in love became this new style of working for me. And so I would use the creative nonfiction form to try and challenge and question and break down some of those arguments and try to insert other narratives into that process. And it got me like a lot of really crazy hate, um, but it was fun. My favorite was the McLean's article about being an indigenous trans woman. And then I started reading the comments <laughs> and don't read the comments. It was, it was not good. But you know, people on the East coast really liked me. There were a lot of old maritime guys being like, she looks good. I'm, <laughs> you go girl. And, and then people out West did not like me. The prairies was real cold. Um, but so for me, in terms of my own form and genre, I think, you know, I've, I'm a poet and poetry is still my first love, but as your needs change, and I think as your experience changes, you find other art forms to respond to violence. And for me, creative nonfiction was a way to be like, fuck you, trans women are beautiful and powerful and your dick does not validate us. And yeah, yeah you should go fuck yourself. Um, <laughs> and I... He, yeah, he doesn't need he doesn't need to fuck himself. He's enough help with that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried. It was a really hard question. 
Yeah, but at least you could let me bring dicks into it. So thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, Gwen, I think that's a really good point that the different forms allows you to do different things. And so depending on where you're at um, creatively or what you, need to, what you need to say the most in that moment, uh, depending on your circumstances, the different forms allows for different things. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I do hop around in different forms. Um, I always find like, um, poetry is, is a great place for my rage. Um, I, just like, um, and I'm glad that you're doing love poetry because, like, we need that too. Like, just ri poetic rage all the time is is not going to necessarily help, although it might help me. Um, <laughs> I think my my love, um, my greatest love, I think, it, for form is um, writing uh, speculative and weird stories, um, and. I think my original appreciation for it comes from um, folk legends um, and ghost stories. Um, so those feelings of um, wonder or uncanniness or horror, um, I think those feelings are probably also very, very present in our lives um, as lived experiences that, that something is, this is truly weird or this is uncanny. Um, and feelings of estrangement um, is, I think, is, is an experience that we have over and over again, living in a, a straight, cis, heteronormative, patriarchal world. Yeah, so, you know, what is this strangeness that I'm feeling? Um, and so I feel like my stories that are, a lot of them is like moments of transformation um, or magical things happening. Um, and I find it recently, it's turning more and more to, to horror. Um, and, and I think that's also probably reflective of sort of the sort of social environment um, we find ourselves in. So I, I find these, yeah, th that's, th that's sort of the area that's speaking to me right now. I think it'll probably shift um, over time as well. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I just wanted to stop and reflect for a second how many times the word love and celebration and ideas of desire and um, beautiful sex and lust and all of these things have come up on this panel. It just really is resonating with me um, a lot. So to change course, um, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about the publishing industry. Um, <laughs> for a second. Um, and then there's some fabulous questions um, that have been provided by the uh, conference organizers. But I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like there isn't one, but um, if, you could ref if you could discuss maybe some of your experiences or your reflections on um, the way that power continues to circulate and erase and tokenize um, and um, you know gentrify to use Cyrus's amazing terminology there, um, QT BIPOC experiences. Um, I'm sure you all have things to say. Um, uh, in many ways, I feel like I was quite quote unquote lucky. Um, obviously, I have t loads of talent. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think there can be barriers, um, and in many ways I was quite lucky um, in terms of my first book, um, moving out of uh, creative writing courses and completing it and moving on to be um, a, a published novel um, in, a, in a fairly straightforward manner that not everyone experiences. Um, that, that book was uh, straight. Um, I, was, I came out later in life, so... Um, it, it, it might have been, yeah, I'm sure it would have been more difficult if the content um, had queer content. Um, I think it was like, I kind of like to think of it as swishy, um, but it wasn't quite uh, fully queer at that time. Um, I feel like there's different ways of, to publish. Um, I think 
mainstream publishing is all about money. Um, and so, you know, there are certain kinds of stories that are marketable um, in, in the literary world. And so that's, that's its whole thing. And, it, it, it's, it's mo and the movement is, is, is about capital. Um, but with all the, you know, pros and cons, with um, all the sort of uh, media technologies we have now, I feel like uh, the face of publishing is changing and shifting, and that we as producers have more um, power and control in ways of which we publish, not necessarily paper-based anymore. There's a lot of reading that goes online. Um, and so, I, you know, I think that's, it, it, it's a very empowering tool um, for many of us uh, who have the privilege to have um, first, um, you know, the gadgets, um, and then to be in a region that has um, the hookups to make those gadgets work. Um, but I, yeah, I think it's, I think, so there's an interesting shift coming in terms of publishing. Um, fuck Canlet, <laughs> fuck Canlet. Yeah, fuck it all the way. Um, I mean, I think publishing is still really fucked up in Canada. I think it's really controlled by, you know, a lot of um, cis white men who mostly are sexual predators, and there's no female-bodied writer that I know that hasn't been randomly sexually assaulted in some way relating to being a publisher or being a writer. So I think there's lots of problems and, and lots of issues in publishing and they're trying to change it, I guess, sort of. But they're having a lot of conversations around improving publishing, but it's not really going that far. I think the, the thing that we have to do as Indigenous and, and, and QPOP people is just publish ourselves and buy ourselves and read ourselves and support ourselves and go to each other's events and create an alternative literature community that doesn't rely on these like fucked up white people. Um, I just got in, like, I just got into a fight with my publisher this week. I wrote my fourth book of poetry all about um, my abusive relationship with my my ex partner, and who was super transphobic and racist. And then my publisher was like, "He has to consent. You know, he needs to consent to this book before we publish it." And I tried to get his consent, but he wouldn't. But I I, I wanted to say back to them, like, "Do you realize the politics of being a trans woman?" Like, he told me he's ashamed of being seen in public with me. He wouldn't let me post a photo of us together for a year. He wouldn't introduce me to his family. Uh, he's not going to let me give consent for me to publish a book about him as an indigenous trans woman because uh, trans women are seen as shameful and disgusting. Like, um, But the fact that my publisher is sitting there being like, no, you need his consent. You need this white man to consent to you even though he is deeply ashamed of you. Um, it's just, I think, epidemic of like what's fucked up about Canlit publishing and their politics around gender and representation. So I think, and this comes back to the representation conversation, they're really eager to be like, we want to publish you know, an indigenous trans person, but we don't want to do the work of respecting or understanding what that means. We just want to put your bio and your face out in our publishing list, but not actually support you as a person in a way that's culturally appropriate and sensitive to what you're experiencing. So fuck publishing, and yeah, that's kind of all I have. I need to smoke. <laughs> um, this. Are we too close? That's a little porn there. Um, this makes me really angry, uh, and I, I have to um, agree and also say fuck Hanlit because the uh, Canadian literature community is run by um, straight white men. And, um, and it's, I'll give you two right now examples of what Canlit is right now. Um, six very brave women in Saskatchewan uh, recently pulled their work from an anthology that features Saskatchewan women and two spirits and um, men and writers from that community. The reason they pulled their work from the anthology was because uh, this publisher 
dis decided and chose to include the work of a man who um, pled guilty to domestic assault, um, but has been known in the community as an abuser for many years. It's like an open secret that aunties know um, and tell each other and warn people about. And we have many of those men in our community. Many of those conversations are happening right now on Facebook and, and social media and in, in bars and in kitchen tables and in teepees and circles everywhere where we talk about these men. We know who they are. We have a list. Um, we're fucking watching you. Um, so these women pulled their work because this publisher decided to and chose to include and support the work of a domestic abuser. Uh, they, were, they asked that his work be withdrawn. They were told no because we don't want to censor him. Um, then it took, it took them writing, writing an open letter putting that open letter out in the community, having community support that letter, put their names on that letter, and say, this is not right, this is wrong. You must respect our lives as Indigenous women, as, as, as Indigenous Two-Spirit people, over and above a man who beats us. So that's what's happening in the community. I'm gonna take you back a few, was it last year maybe? Not even that, it was this year. Appropriation Prize. Top straight white people decided that Appropriation Prize was appropriate to champion. Jokingly started um, raising money about this Appropriation Prize. Who can appropriate the best story? Like it was some kind of joke, like our lives and our stories and our, and our existence in this space that we've occupied for thousands of years since time immemorial, they have a right to steal those and say that you can't tell us to be quiet because that's censorship. So we get to steal not only your land, not only your water, not only your resources, but your bodies too, and your lives too, and your stories too. And that's wrong. So that is what we're, we are coming up against. That is what we have to deal with every single day, is to tell people the fucking obvious, that you don't get to uphold these people and then tell us you want us to be part of the, the circle, part of your voice, part of your catalog, part of your box that you check off. No. And that, that's the bad news, but the good news is that we're pushing back and saying, no, Neil, this person that I'm talking about, I don't want to name him because he doesn't deserve to be named. He doesn't deserve the breath that I give to name him withdrew his work, but after saying, I've done all this work, I've done all this healing work, I've done this, I've done this, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna, I've only been charged one time. That's not an apology, motherfucker, just saying, um, to, you should have not even had to have done that, he should have not been included. We need to make our own spaces. QPOC made their own space. They kick down the door, um, and they make their own spaces. And they bring those voices in to take those voices out. Um, as an Indigenous person, when I moved here 20 years ago, I tried to join the Manitoba Writers Guild. I tried to join these spaces, these, and it was all white people. It was all Mennonite people. I don't know why Mennonites like to write and <laughs> join clubs, but apparently it's a big thing. Um, I didn't see myself reflected. I didn't see my, hear my stories. I didn't, there was no brown faces. There was no, no people of color. There was no queer people in these, in these spaces. So. I made the space, and I, and I started the Indigenous Writers Collective, and we made space, and we, we spoke out, and we wrote poetry, and we had, we had events, and we published our own work. As Gwen is saying, um, it's imp so important to do that. You can't wait for permission, because they're, they're not gonna be like, oh, come on in, please, we want you here. They might say that, but it's under a whole bunch of different rules. It's under a whole bunch of different walls. It's in a box. We have to make our own spaces. We have to make our own spaces. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I mean, all of the responses from the panelists have 
really spoken to the central question, I think, of this panel, which is um, where can people go next? What can be done to continue um, challenging these things? Um, I really love the idea of creating new spaces, of supporting and reading QT BIPOC writers, um, and going to exhibitions and um, engaging in these ways. I think that's such um, an, a sort of enriching way to support folks. Um, so maybe my final question, then if there are other folks, um, ideally uh, QT BIPOC folks in the audience who have questions, my final question is really quick before that, and that is, um, whom are you reading? Gwen. I'm reading Gwen, <laughs> who I love. And, and you know, I, I'm always looking for work to read. I've Joshua, um, Billy Ray Belcourt, um, you know, uh, it's anybody that I can find, I, I read. You know, people send me their work, and I read that. And, like, I just, Chantel, of course, and her amazing work. Um, any, any, anybody and everybody I like to, to just the more people we have in our circle, the bigger it is, so. Um, obviously, I second Billy Ray Belcour and Joshua Whitehead and Lindsay Nixon, all fabulous uh, queer indigenous authors who are doing really good stuff. When I transitioned, I lost a lot of community and then weirdly ended up finding a lot of community in QPOC spaces. So I really look to writers like uh, Jia Cheng Wilson Yang, who's a trans Chinese Canadian writer in Toronto, Kai Cheng Tom, who's a Chinese Canadian trans writer, uh, Vivek Sharea, Casey Plett, Trish Sala, Morgan Page. Um, a lot of the trans writers that are here in Canada are making amazing, brilliant, brilliant work. Um, Casey's The Safe Girl to Love is probably one of the best short story collections you can possibly read. So if you haven't read it, read it, read Small Beauty, um, read all of Kai Cheng Tom's work. She just made a children's book and it's really cute. Um, and that's where I guess I'm looking. I look, I look to indigenous writing and I look to trans writing and that's where I find, I find a lot of power in that. Um, the last book I read was um, Mane Shakavi's um, To Spirit Journey. Um, just, yeah, just, wow. Um, very powerful storytelling. And um, I'm currently reading um, Robin Kimmermer's uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, just speaking of love, um, just, just so much love in there. Um, it, it, and especially during kind of moments of despair. Um, um, yeah. Just beautiful. Um, I'm reading a lot of stuff online, um, and I'm trying. I, I think it's. I, I need to stop doing that because it's not. I feel like my mind is kind of fragmented um, because of uh, uh, Twitter. <laughs> so, but which you can follow me on Twitter. <laughs> yes, um, but. Yeah, oh, I was going to say something else, but I'm getting scattered and I, I'm getting hungry, so I can't remember. But maybe it'll come up later. Hi? Yeah, and I actually I just forgot. Also, queer black writers. Um, Kinesia Lubrin, who just published Voodoo Hypothesis, which is fucking incredible. And Carson Sharp, Kason uh, Sharp. I always call him, I am fuck up his name. Kason Sharp, who just published Our Lady of Perpetual Realness, which is a fucking amazing collection. Um, they're incredible also. Um, what, just, I have something. Um, it, this is not, uh, I've, I've actually like just stopped reading um, white male cis authors. Um, just just, be, just for, maybe I'll read it again, but I, I mean, I, I feel like I've read a lot of their stories um, and novels to date. So, you know, I'm just not, I'm just like taking a step back. And so th that way I can focus on the stories that have rest read less um, of um, from grade school. Um, I love that. That's amazing that you've stopped reading straight white men. I, I Actually, I can't remember the last novel or book uh, that I've read from a, a straight white person, actually. I, my bookshelf is just all indigenous authors, queer authors, um, people of color, and, and um, I, I stand with, with, with my community in that way. Um, I think I saw someone's hand raised at the back. Is somebody, do you have a question? Oh. 
So I'm wondering um, how you, or if you, or how would you, uh, would you, uh, what was I going to ask? <laughs> um, kids, uh, youth, um, what would you recommend or suggest folks do creatively to connect with youth, to share stories with youth, um, to empower and inspire young creatives who um, are going to be doing a lot of this work after we're not doing this work? Um, I'm going to talk to you about my, my child, and I'm going to start crying. Because um, I didn't actually give birth to my, my kids. I was gifted them. They're, ad they're adopted. And um, my eldest child is, uh, when she was six, we were um, sitting all together as a family. I believe it was Thanksgiving. And... Uh, going around the table talking about what we're thankful for. And uh, my, my, my little person, she was six at the time. She, he was six at the time. They were six at the time. And uh, she looked up and looked around the table and she said, um, I am grateful for the fact that I like girls like my mom. She came out to the family when she was six years old. Um, bravely, without thinking that she would be hurt or harmed because she was loved and because she was supported, she was able to say, I like girls like mom. And her grandmother looked at her a little bit surprised and I went, don't even. And uh, then she looked around and she said, now pass the potatoes. <laughs> so uh, my, my, my girl, my boy, whatever she chooses to be, has grown into this amazing human. Um, she doesn't wear skirts. She hasn't worn dresses since she was eight. She may be transgendered. She may not be. She may be fluid gender. She may be a, a he, a she, somewhere in between. I don't care. But um, she comes from a place of love, and uh, I think about her, him, them, um, a lot when I write poetry because I want that to be left as a gift, as, as something that she can say, look how much I was loved, look how much um, I grew into love because... My mom made space for me. My mom cut a path for me. She kicked down some doors for me. And that's what I always walk in this world knowing that I am cutting that path for, for, my, for my, uh, my loved one um, who is able to come out and be strong in, in, in themselves in that way. And so when, I think, when, I when you talk about what, what kind of advice would I give, I, I would, that's the advice I would give. Make a path for the young people. Um, use your voice to speak up for the young people. Um, tell them that they are loved and that there is, that there is only love for them and, and give them that strength of, of, of where, who you are. And uh, um, you'll never, never go wrong that way. So I have the pleasure of co-facilitating a therapy support group for trans feminine youth in uh, Toronto, where I live now. And they're youth from the ages, you know, of, of 16 up until 24. And so we work with them, and they're all in different stages of their transition. Some of them are starting hormones. Some of them haven't started. They're, they're working their way through that process. And we're... To, we're art-based, so the idea is that we're, we're doing art creation actively through that group. But I think the thing that I've learned through that process of working with them is that the most important thing I can give them isn't, you know, technical knowledge of this is how you write a poem or any of that. It's remembering their pronouns. It's seeing them as women before the rest of the world will. 
It's holding space for them. It's letting them know that they are loved and they are seen and they are protected and they are sacred and holy in their bodies and that I will always have space for them, whatever it is. And every session that we do, at the end of the session, I always make a point of asking every, every one of them as we check out, are you safe? And that question, are you safe, is really me saying, I'm here to make you as safe as I can. You know, I will hold and protect you. I will carry you as much as, as I'm able to. And that act of love, that act of kinship and community and saying, I see you, I hold you when no one else will, I will always honor your truth, that I think is what enables them to create. Because they have all of that magic and wonder inside them already. I like watch them and those girls just like fucking go crazy and they come up with the weirdest shit and you know, you just let them go. Because once they know that they're safe and they're held and they're loved and they're witnessed, all of that power just moves through the world. And I think that that's what we have to do is, is hold them and make them feel that love and know that they're safe to take risks and experiment. And then that's all we really need to do, you know, because they're already smarter than us. They are closer to spirit. They're new to this world. They have power we need. Um, so that's what I think. Um. I, I mean, I think, yeah, I think the the young people. I, it, it's, it's, it tells me that I'm getting older because I refer to the, the young people as the young people, <laughs> which only just sets me off as an older person. So like, oh well. Um, I I think the young people know what they want and need, um, and so for those of us who possibly hold more power because of economic stability um, or our age because of, um, you know, having um, adult freedom uh, in, in this ageist world. It's, we need to listen to the youth um, and then, li and, and then uh, put out money <laughs> um, because it basically takes money to create spaces um, to um, meet the needs of, of the most vulnerable. Um, and those resources are necessary. Um, and so, you know, it's a perennial question, like there's so many ways, so many areas that, uh, where we see a need. Um, but, you know, people who have like, uh, full-time tenured positions. Um, can you share your resources? Can you share your wealth? Um, what kind of spaces are you creating? Maybe you're too busy to have, uh, maybe you're too busy with your um, work schedule. Then, then share your resources. Um, and then have um, the youth run the spaces. Um, and then have the youth decide who they would like to come in as mentors or teachers or faci facilitators. But, you know, basically I'm saying rich people share your goddamn money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. No strings attached. Um, unless there's anything else, I think that we've come close to the end of our time. Um, and so please join me in again thanking um, the fabulous members of this panel, um, Hiromi Goto, Gwen Banawe, and Rosanna Dearchild, and Cyrus Marcus Ware. Thank you. <laughs> and stay tuned for an announcement. <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to use this mic because it's easier. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, okay, so I'm going to sound like a broken record. There's roundtable questions at your tables. Uh, we'd like you to take, uh, you know, 20 minutes to sort of go through those questions, calls to action, things that we need, right? Um, fuck, can, lit, but okay, so when we fuck it, then what do we do? Um, so how, what's our next course of action? So please, uh, we have been reading them, we've been uh, 
Chantelle and I, um, we were going to have a little summit report this afternoon. Um, lunch is going to be served soon, uh, but to take some time around your tables to um, give us some calls to action. Once again, just a round of applause for this wonderful, wonderful panel.